Hi, everybody, and welcome to our Shabbat study series. I am Apostle Destiny Hancock of Sword and Hero Ministries. Thank you for joining along on our Zechariah study. Today, we are going over Zechariah chapters 3 and 4. As always, I'm going to do a read-through of each chapter, and then after I do the read-through, I'm going to do the breakdown to find out what we're actually being told in these prophecies. Each chapter is only about 13 to 14 verses, but they are jam packed with information to understand not only about our walk with the Father, but about what we can expect regarding end times prophecies. So come along on our Shabbat journey. Zechariah chapter 3, and for those curious, I am reading from a Nelson's King James study Bible. And he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan, even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with a change of raiment. And I said, Let them set a fair mitre upon his head. So they set a fair mitre upon his head and clothed him with garments, and the angel of the Lord stood by. And the angel of the Lord protested unto Joshua, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, If thou will walk in my ways, and if thou will keep my charge, then thou shalt also judge my house, and shalt also keep my courts, and I will give thee places to walk among these that stand by. Hear now, O Joshua the high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee, for they are men wondered at. For behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. For behold, the stone that I have laid before Joshua, upon one stone shall be seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave the graving thereof, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of the land in one day. In that day, saith the Lord of hosts, shall ye call every man his neighbor under the vine and under the fig tree. Wow, that was a lot. In just 10 verses, we get an image of what is going to take place at Judgment Day for each of us. And we get an image of what took place for Joshua, the very same Joshua that led the Israelites into the land of Canaan. So what are we fully seeing here? Well, we must first understand that these 10 verses are an image of Joshua at his judgment. So let's start from the very beginning. Verse 1, we have Joshua who led the Israelites into the promised land. The angel of the Lord of hosts or the angel of Yahuwah, that is Yeshua. And we know that Yeshua is our mediator. And so why else is Satan there? Because he is the accuser and they are standing at the right hand of God, arguing over Joshua, God, the father, Yahuwah. He says, I rebuke you. I don't accept your accusations. I have accepted Joshua. And so Yahuwah rebuked him. And what I love about this, he says, is this not a brand plucked from the fire? So when we go to the original Hebrew, the word brand is the Hebrew word ood. And it has it's a root word that means to rake together, to like bring close to you. And then branded by the fire. Oh, so what do we see here? Well, remember, Job talks about how those who passed before Yeshua came down in the flesh Every, all of those souls existed into Abraham's bosom. Because why? Yeshua is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man come to the Father except by him. Don't believe me? Keep listening. Verse 3, Joshua was in Abraham's bosom. Yeshua came to him after his sacrifice. 1 Peter 3, 18 
and 19. So get this. Let me open up to it here. I love how much scripture just intersects and like proves itself across the board. So 1 Peter, we got a chapter 3, verses 18 and 19. It says, For Christ hath also suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Verse 19, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. These are they that passed before Yeshua came in the flesh. And this is where Joshua would be at, along with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, whole bunch. So Joshua was among those that were resurrected with Christ when he raised from the dead three and a half days later. And this is why it's a brand plucked from the fire. This is why his clothes were filthy and tattered as they had been burned. And this is why, verse 4, Messiah found him in the Lamb's book of life. Which is why, for verse 2, Revelation 3, 5, Joshua was with the faithful servants of the church of Sardis, the heavenly priests. Oh, this is just beautiful. But I also want you to make note here, Revelation 3, 5 is also where it talks about that those who overcome in the church of Sardis will have a change of raiment. Yeshua, the angel of the Lord, called for Joshua to have a change of raiment, and which all of the angels of heaven did it. But what I love about verse 5 is Zechariah was fully involved in what was taking place. Zechariah told them to put a fair miter on Joshua's head. Now a fair miter in the Hebrew is samif, which means a headdress or to wrap around. This is a head covering or the helmet of salvation. And this isn't a new concept. Remember back to Exodus chapter 39, where it's talking about the holy garments of the priests. This is part of that armor of God that we learn about in Ephesians chapter 6. Joshua was being dressed to be in the presence of the Father. In verse 7, it talks about the importance of following in Yahuwah's ways and Yahuwah's laws, Yahuwah's Yahweh's statutes, his feasts, the things that he set apart to be holy and righteous. And when doing these things, we get an, a picture that in heaven, we actually have jobs and responsibilities. The first job, the first job that's mentioned is that Joshua will be able to judge the house of Yahuwah, judging all of the angels. Deuteronomy 17.9 That he will maintain the heavenly courts. Malachi 2 7, and that he will walk in the promised land. Deuteronomy 26 15. This image of Zechariah seeing Joshua's judgment and the rewards that were being placed upon him for his deeds, because he had already now been saved by his belief that Yeshua was the Messiah. And this is just a beautiful picture that we are getting here. In verse 8, have you ever wondered why in Revelation, whenever they're talking about the 24 elders, the only scripture references you can find about the 24 elders are other places in Revelation? Well, that's because Zechariah 3, 8 was neglected. You see, because we're seeing here, it says Joshua is a high priest. And to be an elder, you have to be a high priest or a person of wisdom, of knowledge of the, with the Holy Spirit, be of wise counsel. So it's not about your age, but it's about your spiritual growth and spiritual maturity. So Joshua, the high priest, and his fellows, fellows being like-minded, same company, same position, are men wondered, not astonished but wondered as in who are they men wondered at is the 24 elders surrounding the throne of the father 
And Yahuwah goes down and he tells them that I will bring forth my servant, the branch. The branch is the bride, the body of Messiah. Those of us who are following in spirit and in truth after him. How do we know this? John 15, 5, Yeshua tells us that he is the vine, but we are the branches, which means the branch is the one that is chosen, that is after the heart of the Father, in spirit and in truth, no matter what it looks like to the rest of the world, being set apart for him. The branch in verse 8 is the bride. Verse 9 the stone with seven eyes. Oh. Now we're going to see more about this in chapter four, so I don't want to give it away. But anytime you see the number seven in prophecy, it is important in discussing groups of set apart people and in discussing victory. Seven is the number of victory, not the number of completion like we've been led to believe. And so he engraves on the stone, the Lord of hosts, or Yahuwah. Yahuwah is the Lord of hosts. That's Revelation 2.17. The victors of Pergamos receive a stone with a name put in it. And one day, and in one day, all of the iniquity is removed from the earth. This is talking about the millennial reign. We know, according to 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, that one day is as unto a thousand years. So during the millennial reign, all of the iniquity will be cleansed of unrighteousness from the land. The earth is corrupted, and we know how in Revelation 19.2, there is a judgment on the earth, all of Revelation 18. And the earth is redeemed in the righteousness of Yahuwah's ways, Revelation 19.6. The kings and priests... Those are the ones that will be teaching the Torah, teaching the commands, the statutes, the ways of the Father. Because the only way to get rid of unrighteousness is to have righteousness come in its place and cleanse it out. Verse 10, during the millennial reign, in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, shall you call every man his neighbor under the vine and under the fig tree. This is Hebrews chapter 8, verse 11. We will no longer need to be spreading the gospel of Christ so that we can reach the lost that they may be found. Why? Because we won't need to preach of a Savior that we were living among. That's why everybody will be our neighbor, because every knee will bow at the sight of our Messiah. Under the vine, John 15, 5, and the fig tree. The fig tree is Israel, both born and grafted in. That's right. If you're not a blood-born Jewish person, but you accept Christ as your Messiah, as your Lord, and you are chasing after him in spirit and in truth, you are of the fig tree. This is just a be beautiful picture of the things that we know that we can hope for and experience. That even through all of the sin that was in Joshua's life, even though he did great things for God, accepting Yeshua brought him into this place where he could be wrote in the Lamb's Book of Life, brought into the kingdom of heaven, and then his works out of righteousness for the Father were rewarded, for we set up rewards in heaven. Uh, just wait till chapter 4. All right, Zechariah chapter 4. It's only going to get better from here. And I hope you guys are taking notes. And I hope that you take this and you go and read and study Zechariah for yourselves. Allow the Holy Spirit to show you the same things that I'm speaking on. I'm not the be-all, end-all. Heaven is. And the angel that talked with me came again and walked with me as a man that is wakened out of his sleep. And said unto me, What seest thou? As I said, I have looked, and behold, a candlestick of all gold, with a bowl upon the top of it, and seven lamps thereon, and seven pipes to the seven lamps which are on the top thereof, and two olive trees by it, one on the right, and one on the left side thereof. And so I answered and spake to the angel, 
that talked with me, saying, What are these, my Lord? Then the angel said and talked with me, answered and said, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. And then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Who art thou, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel? Thou shalt come a plain, and he shall bring forth the head stone, thereof with shoutings, crying, Grace, grace unto it. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands shall also finish it. And thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts has sent me unto you. For who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel. With those seven, they are the eyes of the Lord, which run to and fro through the whole earth. Then I answered and said, What are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side? And I answered again and said unto him, What be these two olive branches, which through the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out on themselves? And he answered me and said, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Then he said, These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. You can't honestly tell me you don't already have revelations and pictures imaging in your head because I know when I read this the first time, I was blown away. So let's get a little bit of understanding before we go into explaining chapter 4. During this vision, Zechariah knows that he is speaking with Yeshua. Not just from the third vision where the angel of the Lord is Yeshua, but he addresses him by saying, listen again. Verse one, chapter 4, verse 1. The angel that talked with me came again and waked me as a man that is wakened out of his sleep. During this vision, Zechariah knows that he is speaking with Yeshua, who will be our Messiah, who is the Son of God. Verses 2 and 3 is describing a menorah. So a lampstand or a menorah has one center candlestick, and seven outer branches, because Jesus, Yeshua, is the center. And the two olive trees. This is Revelation chapter 1, verse 12. Go read it. So we have seven eyes from chapter 3, seven lamps with seven pipes. Are we noticing a pattern with end times revelations yet? Verse 5, Yeshua's question infers, that Zechariah, likewise, you and I, should already know the representation of the menorah. Now, I'm not advocating that if you are a brand new believer that you immediately start studying apocryphal texts. I will never encourage that. I truly believe that everybody needs a full, firm foundation of canonized scripture before you start seeking after extra biblical texts. I do believe they are true. I personally have proven they are true. But without a firm foundation, everybody can be confused. But in the apocryphal text is where you have the books 1 and 2 Maccabees. And this explains the story of why the menorah in representation with the churches and the people that belong to the Father, why that is so important. So I encourage you, go read that story. For the sake of time, I'm not going to get into it today. Verse 6, Zerubbabel is so important to understand, and I want to do a full breakdown on the word Zerubbabel. So not only is Zerubbabel a person's name, but I fully believe a name is a, the very first prophecy that is ever spoken over you. And so I find that names tend to be very important, especially in Scripture. Why else would the father change Abram to Abraham? And change Jacob to Israel. 
and he's changing the prophecy being spoken over their lives. Zerubbabel means to be sown in Babylon or rooted in Babylon. Now, historically, Zerubbabel is the grandson of King Jehoiakim of the uh, house of Judah or house of Judea. And he is a leader among the first group of people that were Jewish exiles that were exiled into Babylon. And he is among the first leaders that is leading this group out. Revelation 18, 4, come out of her, my people. But Zerubbabel has two root words. So Zerubbabel means to be rooted in Babylon because he was conceived and born in Babylon. So it's two root words, Zerob, which means to dry up, be warmed, be burned, and be scorched. And the second root word, Babel or Babel, which means confusion by mixing. Zero Babel in a whole word means to dry up and be scorched by confusion from mixing. And what are we experiencing today among the believers in Yeshua and the rest of the world? Confusion by mixing. And at what a perfect time to be having this conversation where there is so much fighting about the celebration of Christmas. Now, I am not going to condemn you. That's not my job. I'm not going to convict you. That's not my job. My job is to share the truth and pray that your eyes are opened and that your hearts are ready to receive. Christmas is and always has been a pagan holiday. We put Christ's name on it, but that doesn't make it designed by the Father. That doesn't make it something that he wants for us. And so when we have Christians who are celebrating a pagan holiday by just slapping their savior on it, all you're doing is affirming them and making yourselves look foolish because the enemy sees that you're celebrating the enemy. And now we are being burned and tormented and all of these fighting, and all of this back and forth, because why? Confusion by mixing. I don't know about you, but my father is not the author of confusion. So this is being spoken by Yeshua, the angel of the Lord, from Yahuwah. I want you to turn with me to Hosea chapter 1, verses 2 through 9. Now, the reason Hosea chapter 1, 2 through 9 is so important, because this is where we get a full understanding that from here until the, the end in the New Testament, every time Israel is mentioned, the father is speaking of the tribe of Judah, the tribe of Benjamin, half the tribe of Manasseh. If you go back to 2 Kings, you'll see why. But here the father makes it very, very clear through Hosea, through his children, what he plans to do with the house of Israel, which is the other nine and a half tribes. The house of Judea is the tribe of Judah, the tribe of Benjamin, and half the tribe of Manasseh. So Hosea 1 verse 2, And the Lord said to Hosea, Go take unto thee a wife of whoredoms and children of whoredoms, for the land hath committed a great whoredom departing from the Lord. And he went and took Gomer, the daughter of De <laughs> blame. I just find that funny, which conceived and bare him a son. And the Lord said unto him, call his name Jezreel, for yet a little while I will avenge the blood of Jezreel upon the house of Jehu, and I will cause to cease the kingdom of the house of Israel. And it shall come to pass at that day that I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. And she conceived again and bare a daughter. And Yahuwah said unto him, Call her name lo for I will no more have mercy on the house of Israel, but I will utterly take them away. But I will have mercy upon the house of Judea. <coughs> Excuse me. And I will save them by the Lord their God, and will not save them by bow nor by sword, nor by battle, 
by horses, nor by horses, nor by horsemen, but by his spirit. Now, when she had weaned Lograhama, she conceived and bare a son. Then God said, Call his name Lo-Ami, for ye are not my people, and I will not be your God. Revelation 3, 9. For I know those who are the synagogue of Satan that say they are Jews and are not. It's a tough pill to swallow, and it's hard to like, whew, like the father really utterly cut his chosen people off. But what is beautiful about the house of Judea is that is the seed of Abraham that bore the seed of Yeshua. And we are the seed of Yeshua, the remnant of the Holy Spirit, because we believed and were grafted in. And it's the depth of our belief that proved that. For further context in this, I encourage you to read Psalm 33, 16, Haggai 2, 1 through 9. That is it's a blessing and a reminder for the house of Judea. Now, I know there's going to be somebody who wants to rebut and say, oh, 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 but there's actually something different. Ezekiel 37, 11 through 14. That's actually concerning the new earth, new Jerusalem, and new heaven regarding the house of Israel. The house of Israel will only have that chance to be restored once they have endured birthing pains, tribulation, and wrath. Once they have been utterly purified. Then they will be able to be on new heaven, new earth, and new Jerusalem. Those who fully separate themselves from the ways of the Father, by whatever reason... This is a warning to you that you still have time to come back. He has not cut you off yet. But do not be warned. Be warned, but don't be fooled. Don't be fooled. Heed the warning. He, he's not playing with any of us. And if you stick around a while, I'll share my testimony of how I personally know that to be true. But let's keep going. Verse 7. Zechariah, in this moment, has the Holy Spirit fall on him so deeply that in just the singular verse, of verse 7 from chapter 4, he prophesies about who Yeshua is, about his first coming, and about his second coming. Let's look at it. He calls Yeshua a great mountain. Matthew 24, 16, Yeshua warns that when we see these things taking place, that we should run to the mountain. Now, I do believe that physically there are believers who are being led that direction, rightly so by the Spirit. But the very first mountain we should run to is Yeshua, for he is our covering. He is our refuge. He is our strong tower, our great mountain. Zechariah prophesies that he existed before Zerubbabel, before the confusion being burned by the mixing. He was. He prophesies that he will become plain, which means upright with the Father, but low level in stature, his first coming, and that he shall bring forth the head, which means top stone. What does this mean? 1 Peter 2, 5, for we are living stones. We, the body, are building the church. We are the stones of the church. Christ is the top, the head of the church. He is the head or top stone, second coming, and it comes with a loud noise and shouting, Teshua, the feast of trumpets. It is phenomenal that a singular verse can outline everything that we've been trying to figure out for the last 1,500 years. 
in the body of believers, constantly fighting, dividing from each other, when the whole time all we have to do is look at scripture and don't try to interpret it if you don't know. And if you still are unsure, always look back to the original language for context. There's a reason it was written in the language it was written in. Verse 9. So it says, Zerubbabel began it and Zerubbabel will finish it. So let's look at it now understanding what Zerubbabel means. Zerubbabel, confusion by mixing, laid the foundation and confusion will be its finish. Now, when we look to our early church fathers, what laid our foundation? The council of Nicaea, confusion by mixing Zerubbabel. Will be its finish, and only then will we truly know that Yahuwah sent Yeshua because of all of the confusion that we will un are under, that we are just crying out for him to come back and give us the answers and straighten us out. <sighs> I don't know about you guys, but that brings me so much joy. Verse 10, small things, for you've despised small things. The word for small things is katan which means insignificant, young, unimportant, with a root word of kut, which means loathe, detest. Which means that you loathe, detest, grieve things that you deem unimportant or insignificant. Now, if I look all across social media right now with all different types of followers of Jesus, followers of Yeshua, a giant majority are arguing over whether it is important to follow the ways and commands of God and are deeming it actually unimportant and significant. They detest it. I fully believe this vision, this prophecy is for us right now as a warning that we got to stop. Even if we don't fully agree in how or why or what, we can fully agree that Yeshua is our Savior and the ways of the Father are still important. For they point to the second coming the way that they pointed to the first. So the loathing and detesting small things. I want to break down the entire scripture of verse 10 right here. And there's its own prophecy with it broken down. Hear this says they rejoice in their loathing of things they deem unimportant, the house of Zerubbabel, and they will see the plummet, which means the destruction of their stones. Remember, you are a stone. Because of hardened hearts and by the hand of confusion, Zerubbabel, with the seven that run back and forth, on the earth, having the eyes, looking with the lens of the Holy Spirit, of Yahuwah. The seven eyes, the seven lamps, the seven pipes. They are the faithful to the Father who are running back and forth, being the watchman. Sharing the truth, giving the warnings. At verse 12 the anointed of the power and authority of Yahuwah. That is the golden oil. And I love this question again, because Yeshua says, know you not who these be? It once again suggests that we should already know. Revelation chapter 11, verse 4. These are the two witnesses. And there's some commentary about the golden oil. I urge you to read in Joshua chapter 11. Sorry, chapter 3, verse 11. I am all over myself tonight. Thank you, Father, for grace. The priests that carried the Ark of the Covenant had to be specifically anointed with a specific oil over their heads and over their feet. So that way they could carry the Ark of the Covenant, which contained 
the glory and the majesty of the Father. Without specific covering and anointing, you cannot be near the presence as much as you try to be. The biggest takeaway I want us to hear from chapter 4, chapter 3, and Zechariah so far. The faithful of the seven churches and the two witnesses will watch the destruction of of the wicked and the lovers of confusion safely in being guarded and carrying the presence of the glory of Yahuwah. There is hope for those who are being faithful. Do not grow tired in well-doing.